since this is not a nutrition class, we're going to focus our talk on not the dietary sources or the deficiency symptoms that you might see, but really just on reviewing functions that we've looked at previously. So let's start with calcium. Calcium is an important ion in the formation of calcium phosphate that is in bones and dentin that's in teeth. Uh, the calcium phosphate is what makes bone the hardest living substance on planet Earth. In the blood clotting cascade, so in the coagulation cascade, calcium serves as a cofactor in the enzymatic reactions that activate a factor that take it from inactivated to activated and allow that activated factor to then activate more factors downstream. In nerve cells, so in nerve cells, this here is a synapse between a neuron and another neuron. But if this was the neuromuscular junction, you would see calcium using the same function and that calcium helps to migrate these synaptic vesicles to the end of the axon and the neurotransmitter is released to generate graded and action potentials on the muscle cell or another neuron. In muscle cells, we need calcium to bind to troponin, and then that binding of calcium to the troponin will cause a conformational change, which then opens up these binding sites on actin for myosin so that you can make cross bridges and have gross muscle contraction. So when you think of calcium in terms of muscles, think of it as a molecular key that unlocks troponin and tropomyosin, directly troponin, so that muscles can actually contract. So phosphorus is the P in ATP. That's one of the most important functions of phosphorus that we've talked about. The three Ps are phosphate containing groups. But again, just like with calcium, that phosphate is also part of calcium phosphate, which is the inorganic part of bones and teeth. Sulfur is important in some amino acids, and it is particularly important in immunoglobulins. It's what helps create that base of the Y shape that we see for immunoglobulins. Potassium is super important in terms of generating action potentials. So here we see, or sorry, potassium leaving the nerve cell during repolarization. We also saw that in pacemaker cells of the myocardium and in the contractile cells of the myocardium. Poor chlorine has kind of taken a back seat to sodium and potassium in our discussions of neurotransmitters, but it is one of the principal anions within cells that actually help to establish that negative charge in muscle cells and neurons. Sodium, we spent a lot of time on. So this is the one mineral that we'd like you to know maximum amounts of consumption for 2300 milligrams per day for someone who is not of african-american or latino descent for those who are african-american or latino then the maximum recommendation is about 1500 milligrams per day and it is um something interesting to note that not all people are salt sensitive. You know, some people can eat tons and tons of salt. The contractile cells of the myocardium, it's responsible for this very fast depolarization. And in the pacemaker cell, it's not here in depolarization that sodium enters, but it's here in that pacemaker potential. The depolarization in the autorhythmic cell is due to calcium entry, not sodium entry. For ATP synthesis, both anaerobic respiration, which starts with glycolysis and ends with the formation of lactic acid, and aerobic respiration, which starts with glucose, involves multiple steps, including oxidative phosphorylation, that's why we need oxygen, oxygen molecule, O2, 
I'm going to give you a video reference that is that will go through them. It's very thorough, but I think it's um, a better way to see cell respiration than to hear someone talk about it is to see the molecules in action. At the very end of the video, you'll also see um, an interesting note about how cyanide affects the electron transport chain and would ultimately lead to someone basically suffocating on a cellular level. This is a nice table that summarizes some of the metabolic effects of hormones that we've talked about including insulin, glucagon, um, I'll let you read the rest, but it will summarize some of the things that I've talked about. It'll bring back some ideas and bring them full circle for chapter 16. And then the last thing that we'll talk about, last concept, is metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is a group of disorders that um, research is showing appears to double the chance of heart disease and increase your risk of developing type 2 diabetes, usually type 2, um, at least five-fold. So heart disease is now the leading cause of death as of 2018, the leading cause of death of both men and women. And unfortunately for women, we have moved heart disease up to the top of the list. It's also a primary killer of African Americans and Latinos. So not, these are American, African American and Latinos, not necessarily Africans who live in Africa because they eat a very different diet than Americans do. And the features of metabolic syndrome include an increased waist circumference, which means people will have more of an apple-shaped body, as you can see in this picture, so that the adipose tissue accumulates around the vital organs. And for the heart, it means that there's more resistance. It has to beat a little bit harder. Pressure has to go up in order to maintain cardiac output with the pressure of extra fat. That leads to the extra blood pressure. Um, increased glucose and triglycerides. So this isn't simply from a diet that's high in calories or high in processed fats or I should say processed carbohydrates, processed foods. It also comes from a diet in which there isn't enough exercise. And there was a study that came out just this week, the last week of March in 2018. It's a preliminary study that needs some more backup that was talking about how we don't necessarily have to do long periods of intense exercise, even five or 10 minutes, multiple parts of the day seems to decrease the risk of heart disease and diabetes development. And this was a study of thousands of people over the age of 40, over a 20 year period. Um, so exercise is pretty important. You know, what the definition of exercise is depends on you. So the decrease in HDLs, and usually there's an accompanying LDL um, increase as well, both of which can come from a sedentary lifestyle or lack of exercise and a diet that's high in processed foods and fats.